was the Salish peoples, the first peoples of this land. How fitting that we are gathered here in the longhouse, a gathering place, a teaching place, a learning place for people of all cultural backgrounds to explore the issues addressed by our speaker this evening. The Willie Unsold Seminar itself is an ongoing living memorial to Willie. Willie, who was a philosopher, educator, and mountaineer, a founding member of the Evergreen faculty, instrumental in shaping Evergreen's distinctive interdisciplinary approach to teaching and learning, a member of the first US team to climb Mount, to climb Mount Everest, and one of two who made the first successful ascent of its West Ridge, and a believer in ethics and community and in challenging people to treat each other better. Willie's legacy lives on in this seminar series, which brings distinguished visitors to Evergreen. Our speakers are selected because their work embodies this legacy and the broad range of interests about which he felt so very deeply. In addition to thanking you all today for attending this evening, I would also like to take a moment to specifically thank the many of you who have contributed financially to the Willie Unsold Seminar. Your generous contributions help to ensure a continuous stream of intellectually challenging and renowned speakers. I'd also like to acknowledge members of Willie's family who are present this evening. Please stand and, and be recognized, Willie's two sons. Krog Unsold is one of those two. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage so he can say a few more words about Willie and the founding principles of the seminar. Okay, I'm gonna keep this real brief and so I am not going to just speak extemporaneously which is my usual um, approach. I'm gonna read from a script. Um, but, so, Regan, my brother, has put in a lot of time to organizing these the points that I'm going to make, and so I want to thank Regan. Okay, Willie Unsold believed in experiential education. Tonight, there's kind of a conflict going on between active and more passive um, learning. Right now in Lacey, the, the city council there is meeting for the first time since one of its members, Jason Hearn, made some really inappropriate Islamophobic statements on his Facebook page. Um, so many folks, including some of Willie's former students, are choosing not to be here tonight, but actually to be there. But tonight we're going to hear a great speaker who is certainly going to inspire us to take actions of our own in the future. So about Willie Unsold. Willie Unsold came to Evergreen, as you heard Michael say, to help give birth to what had been created as an alternative institution of higher education. He came from, the outward, from Outward Bound. Outward Bound is a experiential outdoor program that helps empower individuals to break through the self-imposed limits that they set on themselves. At Outward Bound, Willie had developed the four fundamental principles of education. In the concentric circles, these are first the individual, self-concept. Next is the small group, a sense of compassion. Fi um, further out is social service. This is where you're dealing with society. And finally, going out even broader, it's the cosmos. So dealing with people in a cosmic perspective. But when Willie came to Evergreen, he was first of all, as he told people, he was older, he'd subjected his brain to extended periods of hypoxia, that was doing the Himalayan mountaineering, um, and he was wanting to strive for ever greater simplicity. So at Evergreen, he wanted to embark upon the moral curriculum, which was just expounded upon by, Mike, by Alexander Mickeljohn in, um, education between two worlds. So he opted, so Willie opted to reduce the four circles to one of them. He decided to focus on small groups, interpersonal relationships. 
Given the multitude of problems facing the world, Willie decided that the optimum focus for education, what would make a big, the biggest difference in our world, was to have people learn how to treat each other better. This doesn't just apply to treating each other better, it also applies to treating our planet better. Willie often said that the way we, that if we treat Earth like dirt, then we'll treat each other like dirt. We don't appreciate each other for the rich, unique, fertile soils that we really are, not just dirt. Taking this approach will assist us in overcoming the alienation that separates us from each other and from the natural world that sustains us. So in conclusion, education and life should be experiential. You gotta go out there and do it. Hands-on, that's the best way to learn. Collaborative, because that's the way we learn best. And group-oriented, and there's also got to be messiness. You gotta be willing to get dirty. Risk, risk is a really fundamental, important um, concept that my father really um, argued that he said that all education is risk. Whenever you're learning something new, you're risking not getting it right the first time. You're going to make mistakes. So in order to struggle for racial, economic, and climate justice, as, all, as well as all the other individual struggles that we're engaged in, we have to be willing to take those risks. So I will close with a quote from the great poet T.S. Eliot. And this quote really lends voice to the importance of taking risks as a necessary part of learning. Only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. Thank you, Krog. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Elton Tawe, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Sarah is a member of the Evergreen faculty with expertise in comparative religion. She holds a BA in rhetoric and English from the University of California, Berkeley, an MA in Middle Eastern studies from Harvard University, and a PhD in the study of religion, also from Harvard. With two colleagues, she is currently teaching a full-time academic program entitled A New Middle East, Diagrams, Diagnosis, and Power. Please join me in welcoming Sarah elton -Tawi. Good evening. Thank you very much. Professor Deepa Kumar's visit to Evergreen could not come at a more important time in our nation. A significant portion of our national conversation, whether it is around our presidential elections, our policy towards Syria and its millions of refugees, the challenges of ISIS, the continuing fallout from the war in Iraq, these questions all hinge around some of the issues and concerns of Islamophobia and empire that Professor Kumar takes up in her work. Right here in our local community, as Mr. Insul just informed us, we have a, an issue of Islamophobia that has unfolded, which prevents uh, many members of the Muslim community and their supporters from joining us tonight, though they've indicated that they find that very unfortunate and wanted to, but had to instead be at, an, uh, at a uh, Lacey uh, council meeting to address some comments made by their councilman, Jason Hearn. Um, I, I debated whether I should mention some of those comments, but I think I will briefly, because if this was a class, I would have you deconstruct them. I think it's really important, in it, and uh, if you were to deconstruct them, you would understand how cut out for all of us our work is, uh, and so that's one of the many reasons I'm grateful to Professor Kumar for taking up this kind of work with such consistency and courage. He made the comment that, it's very simple logic, Obama is a Muslim or at least an avid Muslim sympathizer. Um, to remember that 15% of Muslims are radical with violent intentions, that's a lot. Three, therefore, Obama is a Muslim sympathizer before he's an American. 
So if you had your notebooks out and you were sort of following that logic, you would see that there are a lot of assumptions embedded in those comments that um, in, our, in many ways are symbolic of the challenges that we're facing today as um, a nation that wants to maintain a unified populace. So as a faculty member here who teaches religious studies, Islamic studies, war and issues of Islamophobia, I'm proud of the way that our college has responded with agility and genuine concern to this climate of Islamophobia in our nation that is growing increasingly worrisome. We walk a fascinating and complex line here at Evergreen in our programs. We teach students of every color and creed and no creed and gender and sexuality. We teach veterans, we teach refugees, we teach undocumented students and really almost an infinite array of life worlds. We respect all of our students and faculty and within this incredible diversity, we're able to identify universal principles of fairness and respect that I really believe can benefit our nation and our world. As a faculty body, we unanimously passed a statement of concern over our current environment of intolerance and Islamophobia that I think expresses sincere commitment to social justice. You can find that on your seats. I think furthermore, selecting Professor Kumar as our end-sold lecturer this evening is a piece of Evergreen's commitment to looking at questions of Islamophobia with intellectual robustness and seriousness. I'm very proud to introduce her. And I thank her for joining us here tonight all the way from her New Jersey stomping grounds. <clears throat> professor Deepa Kumar, PhD, is Associate professor, professor of Media Studies and affiliated faculty in Middle Eastern Studies at Rutgers University. Professor Kumar's presentation this evening is entitled In Search of Monsters to Destroy, Islamophobia, the War on Terror, and U.S. Imperialism. Professor Kumar is a well-known author who has spoken at dozens of university and community forums on Islamophobia, political Islam, US foreign policy in the Middle East, and women and Islam. Professor Kumar has shared her expertise in media outlets that include the BBC, the New York Times, NPR, and USA Today. She began researching the politics of empire shortly after September 11th, and her second book, titled Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire, which we'll be reading in our program next quarter, um, examines ways in which the Muslim enemy has historically been mobilized to suit the goals of empire. There will be a question and answer session after her talk. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Deepa Kumar. Thank you all. I understand I have to wear this, so I'm going to do so. How do I do that? <laughs> and could we get the... Uh... Okay, well, thank you, uh, Greg Mullins, for inviting me to Evergreen, and thank you to Julie and to Marcia for all the hard work that uh, made this possible. And uh, thank you also to Sarah for that kind introduction and to Therese for their warm hospitality. It's been a lot of fun being here at Evergreen. Uh, the students that I met this afternoon are incredibly smart, so I know you must have an engaged uh, classroom environment, and I look forward to having more conversations with you. I'm also very honored to be giving this year's uh, Willie Unsold uh, seminar lecture. He sounds like an incredible person, and I'm glad that you chose me to uh, give this presentation today. And if possible, there we are. Maybe. Great. So this phrase, in search of monsters to destroy, is from a speech that John Quincy Adams gave in 1821. Um, I hope you know who John Quincy Adams is. He was the sixth president of the United States. And I was watching the presidential debates uh, last October and this phrase actually came up, and it was Martin O'Malley who brought it up in the context of the debate. And if you don't remember who Martin O'Malley is, I don't blame you. 
he was that awkward guy trying to get some attention between Sanders and Clinton, and now, of course, he's quite forgotten. But at any rate, uh, thank you for laughing at my joke. I didn't want to have a Jeb Bush moment where uh, <laughs> I had to say, please laugh. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, um, Mal O'Malley brought this up in relation to the US war in uh, Iraq in 2003. And he said that the US government acted against the advice of uh, John Quincy Adams. And here's how Adams put it in his speech in 1821. He said the United States has, quote, in the lapse of nearly half a century, without a single exception, respected the independence of other nations while asserting and maintaining her own. She has abstained from interference in the concerns of others, even when conflict has been for principles to which she clings as, as, as to the last vital drop that visits her heart. Wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will be her heart, her benedictions, and her prayers. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy." End quote. And of course, this is technically not true. Uh, <laughs> Because we're talking about 1821 and the Seminole Wars had just happened, right? The extermination of uh, and displacement of native people. Uh, we are, after all, in occupied land right now. Um, and uh, in Canada, of course, they refer to uh, native people as the First Nations. And uh, of course, uh, we had the war on Canada in 1812, where the US invaded uh, Canada in order to colonize it. And in fact, the entire 19th century was animated by the idea of manifest destiny, which was the notion that the Anglo-Saxon people have a special mission to conquer and settle lands and build a nation that stretched from coast to coast. And of course, it's this attitude that fueled Western settlement, Native American removal, and then later in the century, the war with Mexico. But it was um, Adams, actually, who gave expression to this idea of manifest destiny in an 1811 speech when he said the following. He said, quote, the whole continent of North America appears to be destined by divine providence to be peopled by one nation speaking one language, professing one general system of religious and political principles, and accustomed to one general tenor of social usages and customs, end quote. And this is, of course, what became manifest destiny destiny and it was European settlers, of course, who were the chosen people who would bring about change and who would bring about uh, this nation. And so right from the founding of the American nation, it was really about in some ways the realization of the settler colonial mission. And even though the American Revolution was actually a remarkable moment in human history, and certainly the US Constitution, a step forward in the Declaration of Universal Human Rights, as uh, scholar Aziz Rana puts it in his book, The Two Faces of American Freedom, in fact, the ideal of liberty of self-rule that animated the American Revolution was from its very beginning based on a politics of exclusion. Not everybody was included in this picture. And at the time, the people not included were not just slaves, African slaves and indigenous people, but also the landless, the white landless, right? As well as Catholics, particularly Irish Catholics. And if Irish Catholics were excluded from this contract, they start to get included later on, but then new people would get excluded, like the Chinese, uh, for instance. And so I say all of this to say that there have always been mis monsters to destroy both within the nation as well as outside. And so I wanted to begin, actually, before I go to Islamophobia as a process by which a race of people, a race of monsters, if you will, has been brought into being, to give a little bit of a history of how there has been a long continuity of these processes of racialization. Here, for instance, you'll see an image of the Chinese monster, right? This is from the time period when we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. And this is Harper's Weekly Magazine, not to be confused with Harper's. And you can probably tell who is on the right, right? That's a depiction of, you know, it's a caricature of African Americans. But can anyone guess who is on the left? Who does that caricature depict? The Irish? Yes, absolutely right. Um, and so there's been a long process by which not only people of color 
but certainly people who are considered white today were also turned into a race of inferiors, turned into threats who must in some ways be controlled and or vanquished. But this threat, such as it is, is actually a threat to a system. It is a threat to a certain social order and a political economy that actually rests on marginalizing and othering gr large groups of people. And which group is converted into a race, is racialized at a particular moment, depends very much on what kind of system is in play and what the interests of the ruling elites are at that moment. And my focus in this talk is going to be about imperialism and the war on terror. And what I'm going to argue is that the processes of racialization that we see today very much sustains US imperialism in the 21st century. And the thing to keep in mind is that empire is not just something that happens out there. It is very much what happens right here, right? And so there are enemies outside, but there are also enemies right here. And today, of course, the key threat, we are told, to American safety is terrorism, right? Um, the war on terror is what preoccupies us. Uh, it is considered to be so big a threat to American safety that trillions of dollars are spent trying to keep us safe. Um, there were two very authoritative studies that were done in 2013 uh, which show, one at Harvard University and the other at Brown University, which showed that up until that point, the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq had cost close to $2 trillion. And the Brown University study said that it's actually going to cost us close to $4 trillion, whereas the Harvard University study said it was actually closer to $6 trillion. And here I'm not even talking about the drone program, the cost of maintaining military bases, about 700 plus military bases all over the world, the domestic homeland security industry and so on. If you add all that up, we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars that are spent on the war on terror, supposedly to keep us safe. And we live in a moment in history where at least half the American public the next uh, thing that I have up on the PowerPoint slide is a poll that was conducted by CNN uh, this past December, where people were asked how worried they were about either themselves or somebody in their family uh, being a victim of a terrorist attack. And what we find is that 15% are very worried and 30% are somewhat worried. In other words, 45% of Americans believe that they or somebody in their family will be attacked, will, will face, will be a victim of uh, terrorist attacks. And it's not just you know, attacks from foreigners coming into the United States. We're also to told that there are people right here who are getting radicalized, who, uh, you know, like President Obama, who's a sympathizer with the terrorists and so on, they're amongst us, they're waiting to attack us, um, and they either want to kill us or they want to take over the United States and institute Sharia law um, or what have you. And so there are a lot of financial as well as emotional resources that are invested in this idea of the Muslim terrorist threat. Now, take a second and imagine what that threat looks like. Close your eyes if you want to, and take a second to think about what, what does this threat look like to you? Probably like this. This is Osama bin Laden. Or maybe like this. This is Jihadi John, the British ISIS uh, person who was responsible for many of the beheadings of Western journalists. His name is Mohammed Mwazi. And in fact, when I was preparing for this lecture, I Googled the term terrorist, and I looked for all the images that came up, and overwhelmingly, the images were either of fully masked men, like Jihadi John, or they were of brown men with beards. The presumption being, of course, that they are Muslims and they are driven by the teaching of Islam to commit uh, violence. And what I didn't find is this image. People may know this gentleman, if we can call him that. Um, he was responsible for the Planned Parenthood shooting. His name is Robert Deere. 
He's an evangelical Christian. And he, by the way, is a great admirer of this group called Army of God. He considers these people heroes. Who are they? They are an anti-abortion group, and they are responsible for numerous bo bombings and murders, right? He hero ver worships uh, these people. And of course, he's not considered a terrorist threat. He's not even considered a threat, even though actually more Americans are killed by these sorts of far right wing forces than by jihadi groups, than by people uh, driven by jihadist uh, philosophy. So the question for us then is what is the actual threat posed by Islamic fundamentalists? Because I don't mean to say that it's non existence. Of course, ISIS is real and they do do horrific things, right? So it's not as if this doesn't exist. Uh, exist. Um, but keep in mind, of course, also that the the main victims of ISIS, of a group like ISIS, are other Muslims in the Middle East, much less uh, Westerners. So let's take a look at what this threat actually is. How much of a threat are Islamic fundamentalists to American safety? But before we go there, let's just have a look at what are some of the most serious threats to Americans? What, how do people die? And this is from the CDC. Heart disease is the number one killer. Cancer, number two. Chronic lower respiratory diseases that doctors uh, indicate as a product of smoking, usually linked to smoking. Accidents, typically car accidents, automobile accidents, etc. cetera. Um, terrorism actually doesn't figure in this list. And so again, in your mind, can you picture a number in terms of how many Americans die each year from terrorism, particularly jihadist, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism. Here then is the scale of the threat. Um, since 9-11, the number of Americans killed in the US by jihadists is 45. Four, five, right? This is according to a study by the New America Foundation. And so it's not in the hundreds of thousands, like heart disease. It's not even the tens of thousands, like some of the other uh, list things mentioned here. It is 45. So is it a threat? Yes. But is it a threat and on the level of the lack of access to good health care? You be the judge, right? And in any society where the well-being of the citizenry is important, do you not think it would be important to have quality, free healthcare available to everyone and trillions of dollars being spent so as to prevent death from heart disease, so as to prevent, find a cure for cancer perhaps, right? These are some questions that really there isn't much attention that is paid to these sorts of questions. Instead, the fear of terrorism is one that is kept alive in our imagination and that's what I want to turn to next. However, for the skeptics among you who are saying, well, the reason the number is only 45 is because the Homeland Security Department is doing such a, an excellent job of keeping all of us safe, let me try to break down that myth as well. Trevor Aronson, who is an investigative uh, journalist, actually studied 500 terrorism prosecutions since 9-11. And he showed that over half of these actually were the product of the FBI instigating plots when none actually existed. It's the product of agent provocateurs. There are 15,000 informants that the FBI has. Most of them are criminals. They are people that somehow have been coerced into becoming uh, informants. And they, what they do, according to Aronson, is they get people who otherwise would not commit crimes to carrying them out. Now, I know this from personal experience, from working with uh, the Newburg Four. This, I know the family of the people uh, who, were, you know, who were part of the Newburg Four. African-American men, um, not fully mentally there, uh, really poor. And this agent provocateur comes into the community, gives them tons of money, uh, says that the way in which they're going to make something of their lives is to actually uh, go up uh, and, and bomb the synagogue in the Bronx, I believe it was the Bronx, or Harlem, I think the Bronx, 
and provides them with the ammunition, provides them with the bombs. When some of them say, no, I, I really don't want to do this, you know, he berates them and says, you have to do this. And then finally they go through with it, and as they're driving up to the synagogue, uh, lo and behold, the NYPD shows up, apprehends these horrible terrorists, and the media just happened to be there, and this lovely big media spectacle comes out of all of this. And the, and the truth of the matter is that none of these guys would have ever done this had it not been for the informer, had it not been for the urgent provocateur. Um, in fact, uh, to make the figure even more stark, the Intercept actually obtained a document from Homeland Security this past November, which showed that there was actually only one genuine terrorist attack that was foiled in the period between January 2014 and September 2015. And this one actually involved the would-be shooters in Garland, Texas. Do you remember that from uh, last year? Where um, Pamela Geller, who is this um, uh, right-wing Islamophobe, and she sets up this cartooning uh, event where people are asked to caricature the Prophet Muhammad, and these two guys show up ready to kill people, but the local police department gets them and kills them and so on. And of course, that's the only foiled terror plot, if you will, but that doesn't stop the FBI from, you know, every two months or so, they will announce another high-profile arrest of some Muslim terrorism suspect, and the media just lap it up. And it's good for business. It's good for the media industry to constantly be covering things like this. It's also good for the FBI because it keeps alive the multi-billion dollar homeland security industry. In fact, the idea that there are hundreds of Muslims who are radicalizing, who are, you know, sort of our homegrown terrorists, who are sympathizers of ISIS and so on, is also not true. There was a full page article in the New York Times. Every now and then, the New York Times develops a conscience and decides, all right, we've got to actually tell the truth about what's going on, even though most of the time we cover what people, uh, what the political elite tell us to do. So the full page from a couple of weeks ago, if you read the Times, full page article with, uh, you know, the sources are from very mainstream sources where they say that 82 people in the US are accused by the US government of trying to help ISIS, of which only two try to carry out any kind of attack, the folks in Garland, Texas, right? Others have tried to travel there, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea that somehow millions, hundreds, thousands, whatever it is, of Muslims are radicalizing in this US, again, that whole claim falls on its face. So, um, 45%, I, I said earlier, 45% of Americans are worried about what is really a minor threat. In fact, you're more likely to die in your bathtub or from a bolt of lightning striking your head than from a terror plot. But this doesn't stop politicians of all stripes, particularly during an election year, and keeping alive uh, the threat of terrorism and presenting themselves as these strong protectors of the American people. Donald Trump, of course, is the most sort of hysterical uh, version of this. Uh, he wants to ban Muslims and all the rest of it. And he is really the most extreme example of this kind of Islamophobia in the public sphere. But quite frankly, as I've argued in my book, as well as in various other pieces, um, he's not alone. He is not a lone wolf. In fact, he is very much part of a system that relies on Islamophobia to justify the war on terror. And the question, of course, is when and how did the threat of this terrorist come into being? And I want to spend a little bit of time going through the history of how the terrorist threat was actually constructed. So prior to the mid-1970s, there was, in fact, no such thing as a terrorist threat. Um, I know many of you were probably born after 1970, and probably many of you have grown up after 9-11, so to actually imagine that there was ever a time when the word terrorism did not exist in the public sphere is probably hard for you to imagine, but please try. Um, this is not to say that hijackings didn't take place, right? There were 85 US planes hijacked to Cuba. Um, but the people who were involved in this were not called terrorists, and the acts themselves were not consistently labeled as terrorism. Instead, these actors were called bandits, 
rebels, guerrillas, urban guerrillas, revolutionaries, insurgents, and so on. In fact, one study shows that prior to the late 1970s, no American president had actually used the term terrorism or terrorist to refer to hijackings, bombings of uh, airlines. Uh, instead, they used the term air pirates, sky pirates, or hijackers, right? So when does this change? This changes by the late 1970s, and all of these things that had happened, bombings, hijackings, kidnappings, hostage takings, they were all melded together to create a new and threatening actor called the terrorist. How does this happen? Well, one pivotal moment in this process is the Munich incident. That is, in 1972, the Summer Olympics in Munich, Germany, 11 members of the Israeli Olympic team were taken hostage and eventually killed by uh, members of a Palestinian group by the name Black September. This was broadcast live by the global media in, you know, all over the world. 900 million viewers heard about this event. And there were many terms that were used to describe the people who carried out these heinous acts. They were called criminals, madmen, murderers. In fact, this is what Richard Nixon had to say about them. He said, quote, they are outlaws who would stop at nothing to accomplish their goals, end quote. But there was no systematic ideology around terrorism in the United States prior to this moment. In fact, the New York Times Index did not even include the word terrorism as a significant category before 1972. However, the term actually did exist and had a developed existence in France, the United Kingdom, Israel, South Africa, and so forth, because the term was used to discuss national liberation and anti-colonial movements that these countries were actually facing. Nelson Mandela, people know who Nelson Mandela is. Nelson Mandela was considered to be a terrorist. And would it surprise you to know that all the way up until 2008, Nelson Mandela was on the US terrorism watch list, right? Um, so there you have it. You know, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. At any rate, after 1972, there is a big debate in the UN as to how to view political violence. And there was no common grounds. On the one hand, you had the post-colonial nations arguing that political violence is justified in the interests of national liberation. On the other hand, the colonial nations the, uh, you know, would argue absolutely not uh, political violence is not justified. Post-colonial nations would talk about state terrorism. Colonial powers would want to not talk about uh, uh, state terrorism. There are two conferences that are pivotal in developing this language and in developing policy that were organized by the Jonathan Institute. Benjamin Netanyahu, the current head of state of Israel, was actually the head of the Jonathan Institute. And he organizes two conferences, one in 1979 and the other in 1984. The first was held in Jerusalem, and the second was held in Washington, DC. And essentially, the argument that gets advanced, and by the way, there are people from all over the world, dignitaries from the US, people from other countries, and so on. The argument that gets advanced at both these conferences is that the Soviet Union is not the only threat facing the West. Terrorists are also a huge threat to Western interests. And for Israel, of course, it was the PLO, it was the Arab terrorist that they want to then present as being a threat to Western interests as well. But between 79 and 84, the Arab terrorist becomes the Islamic terrorist. And this is largely as a product of the Iranian revolution. It's, it's after the Iranian revolution of 1979, the idea of Islam being this monolithic threat to the West to Western civilization, that's the context in which it emerges. And so this is Time Magazine. 1979, Time Magazine cover. And the Iranian revolution is presented not as the work of uh, workers going on strike because they didn't like the policies of the US backed Shard, or students, intellectuals, or religious minorities standing up and overthrowing an unpopular dictator, but really as a cultural yearning
to reshape society in a way that goes back to the Middle Ages, right? I mean, if you look at that picture, and if anyone's ever been to Tehran, it looks nothing like that. That looks like a picture from the Middle Ages, right? All you see is a muazin and mosques and minarets all over, right? And so it's this idea of this unchanging Middle East, which without Western intervention will stay mired within the uh, clutches of religion. This is the clash of civilizations, right? Uh, if people don't know who that man is, that is Khomeini, the person who would uh, take over the Iranian revolution um, in what some people call a counter-revolution, but it's literally the case of good versus evil. This is a caricature, it is a sketch, and here you have this demonic figure of Khomeini. I don't have much sympathy with his politics, but I think this picture is kind of over the top, isn't it? He's got these jaundiced eyes. He looks possibly, I don't know, like a demon of some sort. And there you have the angelic Jimmy Carter. There's a halo effect. And you know the whole clash of civilizations uh, comes into play. In fact, that term clash of civilizations is coined by uh, Princeton University professor Bernard Lewis in a piece called Roots of Muslim Rage, where he basically argues that the East and West have always been at war with each other for over 14 centuries. And this clash is not about politics. It is not about US intervention. It's got nothing to do with um, anything that the West has actually done in terms of thwarting the aspirations, the democratic aspirations of people in the Middle East. It's all about an irrational rage, apparently, that drives uh, uh, people like this, right? People with uh, veins in their eyes, driven just by irrational hatred of uh, America. And here you see it on Newsweek. It's not just older men, apparently even children, are filled with this rage, and they hate us from the moment they are born. And the language that gets cultivated, the Islamic terrorism uh, threat, the rage of these irrational people and so on, gets reflected also in culture. And the clip I'm going to show you is from a documentary called Real Bad Arabs. And Professor Jack Shaheen puts it this way. The movies that we see basically follow Washington's policy. It's reflected in the cinema over and over again, particularly during the 1980s and the 90s, where you had perhaps 30 films which showed Palestinians as, um, as a people who were intent on injuring all Americans. How may we help you, Jad? One of the most despicable portrayals of Arabs and Palestinians occurs in the 1987 film, Death Before Dishonor. First, they murder a guard, and then slaughter an Israeli family. Torture an American Marine, and in cold blood, execute another. And they burn the American flag right in front of the American embassy, and then dispatch a suicide bomber to blow it up. to empathize with any Palestinian uh, on, on, on the silver screen is, is due to two Israeli producers, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. These two filmmakers created an American company called Canon, and they released in a period of 20 years at least 30 films which vilify all things Arab, particularly Palestinians. They even came out with a film called Hell Squad, showing Vegas showgirls trouncing Arabs in the middle of the desert. I think the most effective film they've ever done, one of the most popular and most racist, is The Delta Force. 
Here, Palestinians hijack a plane and terrorize the passengers, especially the Jewish one. Pick out the passport with Jewish names. There is no form of communication more powerful than film in creating propaganda, and Golan and Globus took it to another level. Certainly American producers play a role in vilifying Palestinians. I mean, perhaps the most anti-Palestinian film is True Long. This apparently is the same group which just detonated a nuclear bomb in the Florida Keys. Crimson Jihad will rain fire on one major U.S. city each week until our demands are met. This film is shown on television almost every week, over and over again. It is part of our visual heritage. Give me the key! Come on, child! You don't want to die, do you? Give me the key! And you won't get hurt! I give you my word! No way, you wacko! And we never see, never see, Palestinians who suffer under occupation. Palestinians in refugee camps. Palestinians who are victimized, who are killed. Innocent Palestinians. These images are denied us. Now, why are they denied us? Is there an unwritten code in Hollywood saying we cannot and will not humanize Palestinians? I mean, why can't we humanize Palestinians in the same manner in which we humanize Israelis? Is not the life of a Palestinian child media-wise, Hollywood-wise, politically-wise? as important, as humane, as valuable as the life of an Israeli child? And if the answer to that is yes, why can't we see that on silver screen? Okay. Um, I'd recommend that people see the entire documentary, Real Bad Arabs. It's, it's quite well done. At any rate, I showed that clip to make the case that through the course of the 1980s and 1990s, this kind of cultural work actually creates an association in our imaginations between terrorism and Arab and Muslim people. So that when the Oklahoma City bombing occurs in 1995, immediately Arabs and Muslims are blamed, right? A whole slew of so-called terrorism experts would be trotted out to say this has Muslim terrorism, Islamic terrorism written all over it, never mind, of course, that it's Timothy McVeigh, a homegrown uh, all-American soldier, actually, who is responsible uh, for the attacks. But suffice it to say that when we come to 9-11, the association between Muslims and terrorism gets so cemented in the public imagination that in the post 9-11 period, it is no longer necessary to keep bringing up this image of the brown terrorist again and again. Instead, we see a whole number of security rituals that actually cements this idea and creates a climate of fear uh, in our minds. Now, I live close to New York City. I live right across from Manhattan, in fact. So this is something that I see very often. This is a subway car, right? This is the MTA subway car, and this is an ad that you will see if you are taking the New York uh, subway system. What you'll notice when you look at this ad is there's nothing in the car, but that's the whole point, right? It's the point is to train us to be suspicious of anything and everything. And the truth of the matter is that an image like this would not have worked before 9-11. It would not have been seen as something that teaches us how to be scared, how to be vigilant. And it is only after 9-11 that we learn these security rituals and we have in the culture created a sort of fear and siege mentality with the suggestion that another disastrous event is just around the corner. And it's not just a siege mentality, there is the added um, inculcation of a sense of vigilance or of vigilanteism, if you will. The see something, say something campaign is really about recruiting all of us to be agents of surveillance, right? So this next ad, for instance, is we, all of us, are being invited to be agents of surveillance. And when we say yes to this logic, 
When we say, yes, we are afraid, we think we're going to be the victims of the next terrorist attack, we give our consent to the kind of ubiquitous surveillance that we actually have today and the bloated national security state that we have. And so, you know, no longer, apparently, should be, we be afraid that Big Brother is watching us. People get the reference from George Orwell, right, where he talks about um, the sort of totalitarian society where people are watched all the time. No longer should we be afraid of it because, in fact, our Big Brother is watching over us, right? That's what happens in, in the era after 9-11. And what's interesting also is how multiculturalism becomes very much a part of this siege mentality. It's not just white eyes that are looking, it is brown eyes, it is black eyes, it is Asian eyes. And we're told to be vigilant not just at airports or at train stations or at bus depots, also at sporting arenas. And our coaches train us in the security ritual. I pay attention for a living. I watch plays and make important calls. While I'm busy watching the game, I need your help keeping an eye on the stands. If you see something suspicious, make the right call. Tell a law enforcement official. Right, so it's a naturalization. I watch, you know, the game. I watch plays. You need to watch for something suspicious, right? You need to become um, part of the surveillance state, even. On college campuses, you need to be vigilant. And I think Edward Snowden is right when he says, quote, a child born today will grow up with no conception of privacy at all. They will never know what it means to have a private moment to themselves, an unrecorded, unanalyzed thought, end quote. And so here is the new ritual that we have been inculcated to carry out. You observe and you text. Right, which is very much like duck and cover. For those of you who know what duck and cover is, it was a security ritual that existed back during the Cold War. And I know many of you don't know that ritual, so I'm going to play you a little clip. And this is Bert the turtle, an adorable little turtle. Dum, dum, beetle, dum, dum, beetle, dum, dum, beetle, dum, dum. friends because every one of us must remember to do the same things. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. This is an official civil defense film produced in cooperation with the Federal Civil Defense Administration and in consultation with the Safety Commission of the National Education Association. Produced by Archer Productions Incorporated. Hey Bert, come on out and meet all these nice people. Please? Oh, all right. We really can't blame you. You see, Bert is a very, very careful fellow. When there's danger, this is the way he keeps from being hurt. Sometimes it even saves his life. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover just as you do in your school. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it, just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time. Fire is a danger. It can burn whole buildings if someone is careless. But we are ready for fires. We have a fine fire department to put out the fire. And you have fire drills in your school so you know what to do. Automobiles can be dangerous too. They sometimes cause... All right, you can watch the rest on your own. <laughs> but, you know, people in your parents' generation, some of you are old enough to remember Duck and Cover, yes? and the civil defense drills and actually ducking under your desk in preparation for a nuclear bomb, which um, I think anyone will tell you that if an atomic bomb were to explode, your little desk is not going to keep you safe. 
Um, and so the question then is why go through this drill again and again? What is the point of this security ritual? It is to create a certain threat consciousness. It is to create a certain kind of mentality, a siege mentality, which then becomes the basis from which to give our consent to the growth and development of a massive national security state and the growth and development of empire. Right? So the context for this particular ad and for this particular security ritual was the post-Second uh, World War period, where the US basically is one of two global powers that are left on the international stage. And policymakers at the time, particularly Cold War liberals, would shape and realize a national security state. The 1947 National Security Act was passed, which entrenched security as a key element of the post-Second World War order. It created the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the National Security Council, the CIA. And in fact, there is a top secret National Security Council paper uh, called NSC 68, which laid out a vision for US post-war grand strategy. And it was written in 1950, but it was only declassified in 1975. And it was really one of the most influential, uh, influential foreign policy documents of the Cold War. What was it about? It called for masses, massive increases in military spending, a civil defense program in order to basically ensure loyalty among the citizenry, a media propaganda campaign to build and sustain public support, a psychological warfare and propaganda campaign abroad. And in fact, every aspect of American life, social life, political life, intellectual life, economic life, was actually conceived as playing a role in national defense. And this is how a massive security establishment was constructed, basically paid for by tax increases and cuts in social welfare programs, as well as other services. Now, um, essentially confronted by the collapse of various European powers, as well as the Japanese empire, the rise of the Soviet Union, the US decided that it was going to become a key world hegemon and beat back the threat to civilization only if it thoroughly militarized American society and every aspect of American society. But the growth of this military industrial complex against which President Eisenhower warned us in January 1961 did not actually recede after the collapse of the Soviet Union. If anything, it's gained a new lease on life in the war on terror era. What's changed is that the Soviet Union is gone as a threat to Western civilization. In its place, the clash of civilization and Islamic fundamentalism has actually taken its place. And really, it is not possible to understand the rise of Islamophobia in the current context without situating it within the context of the growth of the national security state and the growth of empire and the kind of ideological reasons why it is important to create this Muslim enemy both at home and abroad in order to reproduce empire. Right? And the US has a number of interests in the Middle East. One of them surely is also oil. Um, and as long as black gold, as it were, exists in the region, there, sh there will be a reason to intervene. And you, know, you can't tell military personnel, you can't tell people, send your brothers, your sisters, your mothers, your fathers to go off and fight for oil. You have to say it's about something greater, it's about something grander, or it's about a threat to our very way of life. And that's the root, that is really the basis from which anti-Muslim racism or Islamophobia actually comes into being. So let me come to a close with this. The cost of anti-Muslim racism is indeed quite high. 2015 was actually the most dangerous year for Muslims since 9-11. You can look at the three Muslim students who were killed in North Carolina um, earlier last year. We have seen verbal attacks, we have seen physical attacks, cab drivers in New York City being knifed, uh, people having things thrown at them, uh, people being fired from their jobs, and so on and so forth. Uh, mosques being desecrated, Muslim community spaces being desecrated. 
uh, Sikhs actually, Sikhs are not Muslims. People know that the Sikh religion is a different religion from uh, Islam. And yet, because they wear turbans, there's the association between Osama bin Laden, between Muslims and so on, and they too have come under attack and have been killed. Many have been killed um, over the last 15 years and certainly last year as well. In fact, you might be surprised to learn that Muslim women actually face more, uh, are the victims of hate crime more often than Muslim men particularly women who wear hijabs or who wear the burqa or other symbols of Islam. And so what you've seen really is the outward manifestations of Islam, mosques, veils, turbans, and so on have been attacked. And the people in them have been dehumanized, becoming mere vessels of what's seen as an evil ideology that programs people to go off and do horrible things. So, and so, um, Islamophobic ideology, such as it is, is a systematic body of ideas which makes certain constructions of Muslims, such as they are just prone to violence, they are misogynistic, or they're driven by rage and lack of rationality, appear to be natural, appear to be something endemic to who they actually are. And that logic has really become common sense today. That's why somebody like Donald Trump can say what he does and continue to win all of the uh, primaries in the way that he actually is winning uh, because it's, it's become common sense today. And the final thing I will say is that that's why I think that fighting Islamophobia takes more than teaching about the religion of Islam or about interfaith dialogue. That's important, certainly, for people to understand the religion. But if you don't target the root causes of Islamophobia, which is empire, then we simply will not see it go away. And I want to speak to the case of Japanese Americans. People know that after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, over 100,000 Japanese Americans, the vast majority of them citizens of the United States, were rounded up and put into these uh, detention camps, right? Horrible camps, by the way, I've read about it. Uh, and you know, there's like no plumbing in some of them, and old, young, everyone is just thrown into these uh, camps. And fully four decades after that, the Reagan administration finally issued an apology. And why did that happen? It happened not because Japanese Americans had sort of integrated themselves and proved that they weren't a threat to the American way of life or what have you. It happened because Japan no longer posed a threat to the United States on the global stage, right? Uh, the US had long eliminated that by having a footprint in Japan, in fact, still a footprint uh, in Japan, and Japan was no longer a threat, and therefore, it was possible to stop demonizing uh, Japanese. But at the same time as this apology gets issued, Chinese are starting to be seen as the new enemy. So this is not some sort of principled anti-Asian racist uh, position taken by the uh, uh, Reagan administration. Rather, it was when on the political stage the Japanese are no longer a threat than the kind of racist language that you see about them and the practices uh, uh, cease to be. And I think that's a very important lesson for Muslim Americans and those who stand in solidarity with Muslim Americans to keep in mind is that we need to target the structures of empire and we need to say, you know what, the tens of trillions of dollars that are spent in keeping us safe are better spent giving free education to everybody in the United States, having free health care, and having a society that actually depends depends and is based on the well-being of the vast majority, the 99%, as opposed to the agenda of the 1%. Thank you. So I believe we have some time for questions and comments, so uh, please raise your hand and I'll take a stack. I like to call at least a couple of people and then uh, try to address your questions or comments. And feel free to speak to one another. I'm not the only expert in this room. There are people who've studied this topic and so if someone feels motivated to answer somebody else's question, feel free to do so. So just raise your hand. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, 
My question is, considering some of the discussions that I imagine might be going on tonight in Lacey, what do you think is, can be sort of an entry point for people who don't have a background in deconstructing the logic of empire, as you said, uh, that many of us here might have had the privilege to study in classes here at Evergreen, um, to understanding Islamophobia as a product of these political historical processes that you've outlined tonight? OK, thank you. Let's take a few more. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for, for, uh, for coming. Uh, I, I'm wondering what you're thinking about the, um, what appears to be obviously the resurrection of the Cold War. The, 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 there appears to be a new a Cold War in the making that, and very dangerous, I think. The, the two things that come to my mind are the, the demonization of, of Putin and Russia. Um, and and, and uh, you, you mentioned China. Uh, I, I believe there is a U.S. naval fleet within China's waters, as I speak, and this is extraordinarily uh, dangerous and provocative. And uh, I, I wonder whether we, we should be worrying about, uh, you know, a, a regional war in the making that could burgeon into something something worse than that. Thanks. questions? Take one or two more. Uh, in 2002, the uh, federal government launched a program, um, which is right after 9-11, that required uh, males who are 16 and older in 25 different countries, from 25 different countries, almost all majority Muslim or in other Middle East countries, to register with what was in the INS, to report to INS offices, to be uh, photographed, fingerprinted, and, and uh, investigated. And uh, by, uh, nine, by 2003, they had 83,000 of, uh, of uh, men in this category uh, had done that. And um, almost 14,000 of them faced deportation hearings uh, as a result. Uh, in all of this 83,000, they only found 11 people who had had uh, even remote connections to so-called terrorist organizations, and they had zero convictions. So that program uh, ended, but following that, um, they had the investigations by the New York Police Departments, which would hang out in cafes and Muslim uh, communities. You had um, a professor in Florida named Dr. Samuel Arian, <clears throat> who had contributed to a Muslim charity for many years, but then when it suddenly was pronounced as a terrorist organization, he is arrested and spent several years in prison for, for contributing to that public charities. Actually, the majority of domestic terrorist attacks, both before and after 9-11, have been committed by people like the person you saw up here. People who are a member of right-wing hate organizations like neo-Nazis and Ku Klux Klaners. Um, but you don't have any rush to make somebody who's a member of one of those organizations register with the government. It's perfectly legal to contribute to them. You know. um, so I kind of draw as a contrast. If it's somebody who is uh, a not necessarily a white person, but a Christian person, a native uh, person who was born in the United States who commits a terrorist act, they're portrayed as a right-wing, crazy ideologue. If it's a Muslim, the entire community suffers for that. All right, one more, and then I'll come in. Thank you so much for your talk. And, and my question is really an invitation if, if you care to speak about gender and sexuality in relationship to, to the work you've presented this evening. But I'll, I'll phrase the question this way. As you've taken us to the Cold War, it wasn't only the, the, the communists, but also the homosexuals who were part of the hysteria. Yeah. And today we see a, a, a terrific amount of organizing against transgender people. So I wonder if there's something about uh, 
gender and transgender people in particular in relationship to the work you've been doing on, on Empire? Yeah, great. Um, that's a ton of questions. Let's see what order should I take them in. A new Cold War. I mean, it's a Cold War and a hot war as, as well at the same time, right? It's um, the pivot to Asia, as it was called, is about uh, boxing China in. And um, it was about boxing China in in terms of having military bases, not just in Afghanistan and in you know the Central Asia and so on, but also on the other side in Korea and all the rest of it. So. Um, should we worry about that? Absolutely. I mean, the number of bases that the US has around the world continues to grow astronomically. Um, and at any point, one of these bases could become the places from which a Cold War could become a hot war. And, you know, it's, it's not anything that will benefit uh, any of us. So geopolitically, I think we live in far more unstable times uh, today, even though there is the veneer and the facade that somehow the U.S. as the uh, policeman of the world, if you will, has created, you know, uh, a new world order in which everybody uh, thrives and so forth. I mean, there's a lot more that one can say about this, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, stop with that on that question. The entry point. How do people who are not academics, who haven't taken classes, uh, who don't come to lectures like this, how do they begin to start to think about Islamophobia? Well, I, I think the thing to do is to look back at the um, anti-war movement during the 1960s. The Vietnam War, of course, was the war that shaped an entire generation of people. And at first, there was support for the Vietnam War, right? When the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was passed, it was believed that the US should intervene and to, and to defend the South Vietnamese against what was called the Viet Cong and all the rest of it. But along the way, what happens is that students like yourself, um, who were part of a group called SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, would organize teach-ins, they would organize demonstrations, and at first there were just a couple of hundred people. But as the momentum started to grow, particularly around 1968, when um, you know the Tet Offensive happens and it becomes quite clear that the US is not winning the war in Vietnam and in fact probably will not, and the number of body bags coming back home in the form of uh, you know young men particularly being killed in that war, and more and more soldiers actually turning against the war, right? These are people who go there thinking that they want to do something good and realize that they're actually part of an imperial machinery. And uh, we had an economic draft at the time where working class kids particularly, this was the way in which uh, they would advance in society and so on. But they find that, in fact, it was a big lie. And they turn against the war and they come back and then they join the anti-war movement and there are more teachings and there are more demonstrations until it reaches a point where it's no longer sustainable to continue the war in Vietnam. Of course, it does spread to uh, Laos and Cambodia and so on and so forth, but eventually, uh, the war has ended as a result of social movements and as a result of organizing and as a result of teachings and so forth. And the legacy of that movement was something called the, uh, what is it called, the Vietnam Syndrome, which is a hesitancy on the part of Americans to actually sanction ground troops in foreign interventions, knowing that the price is not going to be paid by the elite Right? It's not going to be paid by the uh, sons and daughters of the rich, as the uh, Creedence Clearwater revival song, what is it called? Um, thank you, Fortunate so uh, Son um, illustrates very well, but it's going to be paid by the vast majority of ordinary people in this country. And, but the problem is that after 91, the first Gulf War, and then certainly after the War on Terror, that memory has largely disappeared. And we have much more confidence being articulated in US imperialism today. And the solution still, I think, is to build grassroots movements from below, to actually have education in community forums, in colleges like this, and so forth, and people engaging in discussions not just about 
why this uh, sort of monster, the Islamic monster, why that's not a good idea in terms of just a moral kind of principle, but why we don't benefit from the war on terror, right? I spoke about the costs of it, but what about surveillance? What about all of the laws that have been passed since 9-11 that don't just impact Muslims and Muslim Americans, it impacts all of us. In fact, what starts off as a means by which to round up Muslim Americans has now been used to uh, uh, target dissenters of all stripes, right? So there are people in the Occupy Wall Street movement who have been victims of agent provocateurs and thrown into jail. There have been people, you know, who are part of other movements, the environmental rights movement, the environmental justice movement, and the laws that were created after 9-11, the fear of terrorism and so on, are now being applied to squash dissent of all sorts. So we all pay a price in terms of political freedoms. And of course, we've seen a massive ratcheting up of surveillance, right? There are very few spaces today where we can actually speak freely without, you know, Big Brother watching and uh, who knows what will happen coming out of uh, things like that. But the way out of that is not to be afraid. I think more speech and more courageous speech is what it's going to take to actually create the kind of pressures and the kind of movements that can actually get us out of this impasse. Finally, gender and sexuality and the Cold War and the war on terror. How do I address that without speaking for an hour? Uh, <laughs> um, well, let me just speak about the current moment, which is the remaking of Western nations in this so-called clash of civilizations that we've seen over the last uh, decade or so has occurred in a way that is very similar to what happened in the 19th century in Europe, which is, the idea that the West is a beacon of enlightenment values, of liberalism, of all sorts of rights and so forth. And because those ideas and those values are allegedly not respected by people in these barbaric lands, there is a white man's burden to go off and colonize them and civilize them and all the rest of it. And of course, we don't use that kind of language today. Instead, um, you know, my colleague uh, Jasbir Poor has talked about homo nationalism, which is the idea that the American nation presents itself as a nation of tolerance because we have gay rights, because we have rights, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, uh, as, as people know, recently granted gay marriage. But that didn't happen automatically. People had to fight for it for decades. I live close to Stonewall. If you haven't been to see the Stonewall Inn, there was a massive rebellion against the ways in which the police would routinely harass gay men and women back in the 1960s, back in the 1950s, and so on. They were forced into a closet, and by chance, they happened to meet at these places. They would be harassed, they would be beaten, they would be arrested, and so on. And so these rights, such as they are today, have been won by people struggling for them, by people organizing for them. The same is true for women's rights, right? It took, what, a century for women to actually win the right to vote in this country? And there's a great movie called Suffragette, which if you haven't seen, please go see it. It's about the struggle to win suffrage in Britain and how much these women were targeted. They were arrested, they were tortured in prison just for demanding the right to vote. So even though today it's just sort of taken for granted that we are these civilized people, we respect women, we respect gender equality, we respect rights for gays and lesbians and uh, the LGBTQ community in general, what's erased from all of it is that this is the product of struggle, right? And, it, and, and it's true that these struggles are also struggles that people are waging in Muslim-majority countries. We shouldn't paper over sexism and homophobia and transphobia that exists in Muslim-majority countries as well. That is to say, we can be against Islamophobia, but I don't think that we should be silent when we see injustices taking place in other parts of the world. And I think the key to actually winning all these rights and strengthening these rights is not accepting the clash of civilizations argument, but actually move, building movements from below, linking hands with our allies around the world and fighting for these rights to become true universal rights for everyone. So that's just a brief. Uh, So 
So we have time for another round of questions, comments, disagreements. Please feel free to disagree with me. Hi, um, I wanted to ask if you would be willing to offer um, a definition of terrorism if to the extent that that term continues to be useful and then given that maybe some reflections on white supremacy as a form of terrorism that um, and what that means then for kind of the domestic counterinsurgency strategies in particular um, kind of the changing in police trainings over the last several years which has been kind of re-imported from counterinsurgency strategies used abroad in military operations. And as we know, the police have evolved from slave patrols as a tool to surveil and manage non-white bodies. So then what does that mean when all these things go together from your perspective? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hi. Um, on the admittedly monumental task of confronting the logic of empire, what do you see as the first practical steps to uh, be taken in constructing an authentically anti-imperialist anti left that is actually capable of challenging and shaping U.S. foreign policy? Um, I pose this question not only given the prevailing discourse of racialized anti-terror hysteria a la Donald Trump and his ilk, um, but also in the context of even the best political prospects for the upcoming election. Um, given candidate Sanders' continued support for the Israeli apartheid state, uh, the very likely continuation of the Obama doctrine of more or less perpetual dirty war, uh, what do you see as the answer? Just a small question there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I get these emails, <laughs> which probably have no basis in fact. But uh, they make me wonder about what's going on in uh, Europe as far as uh, people moving in with the Sharia law. And I see things about Brussels, and they say within a few years, you know, 25% of the population will be uh, under Sharia law. So I wonder if you could present any f actual facts about what's going on over there. Uh, so I guess the title, uh, Searching for Monsters to Destroy, reminds me of the epic of Gilgamesh. And I'm wondering if there's some more fundamental structural causes or uh, structures of things like this, like looking at early state formation like, and the existence of like later uh, in like nation states, like uh, with citizenries, there's always a non-citizenry that is like not necessarily targeted, but you see today, like, if you're not a citizen, you're left to die, which is, like, similar to being targeted when there's a surplus. And I'm also just, like, maybe, like, the civilizing process in general, like, like, globally. I don't know. And then also talking about, like, yes, like, these things are bad. Neoliberalism is bad. Neoconservatism is bad. But what about, like, capitalism as, like, f fundamentally capitalism and before that feudalism doesn't seem that good either. Um, and I guess just statecraft in general lends itself to certain things that I don't find desirable in terms of like perpetuating otherness, especially in terms of like queer folk, where like certain like maybe certain people may be like normalized into the society like a gay man or like certain conceptions of like queer folk, but then there's always going to be like other marginalized groups that exist outside of like whatever the normative is. Um, sure. I'm getting tired of my own voice. Thank you again for your outstanding presentation. I'm so happy I got out of my recliner and came here tonight. <laughs> Maybe you could have brought the recliner. <laughs> yes. Th throughout the history of our country, there has always been some type of a threat from the beginning, from the Native Americans to the British through Nazism, fascism, communism, and now terrorism. But they've all dissipated at some time and been replaced by some other type of a threat. What do you see about the dissipation of the threat of terrorism? Okay. Also, th this is kind of uh, on a tangent, but the Rutgers University will be visiting the University of Washington's football team to play them this fall. <laughs> do we have a good chance to beat them? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
All right. Um, well, our football team sucks, so I think everyone beats them. <laughs> Um, but despite that, um, there are millions of dollars that are spent on um, the athletics program because that's the, that's the, apparently, that's the priority of my university. We won't pay faculty very well. We will steal money from students in the form of college uh, fees and we'll throw it into a losing program. By the way, our sports program uh, loses money because, you know, why would anyone want to watch college football when you can go and see professional football in New York City? So, uh, but that's the priority. I had, to, I had to say that because I'm the vice president of my union and uh, we are constantly involved in fighting this. So, um, let's see, whole bunch of questions. White supremacy, terrorism, and strategies of, um, surveillance and all sorts of other strategies. Everything that empire does abroad always comes back home, right? It's not as if actions that happen abroad are somehow things that we are protected from or insulated from and so on. In fact, the CIA uh, coined the term blowback to talk about the unintended consequences of US actions around the world. And 9-11, in fact, is seen as blowback, which is to say that US intervention in the Middle East is what created the conditions that would make some people angry enough that they would join the kind of forces like Al Qaeda to uh, you know, then come back and target people in the United States. And I didn't get to talk much about um, the part that the US government would play in actually fostering these groups, right? Back during the era when secular nationalists, people like Mohammed Mossadegh or um, Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser and you know, a whole bunch of other people refused to be under the thumb of uh, the US uh, state, they were seen as threats and they had to be taken out. And there are all sorts of you know, somewhat bizarre ways in which Nasser, for instance, was targeted by the CIA. They put uh, poison into his cigars. They poisoned his chocolates. And you know, the things that you see in spy films are actually real, apparently. Uh, there's a book by uh, Richard Dreyfus that actually goes into some of this uh, stuff. But at any rate, that's also part of blowback. That is to say that um, Islamist groups, right, whether it was the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, whether it was the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. These are groups that the US government, that the CIA and so on would sponsor and train to be a counter to the secular nationalist forces that the US couldn't bring under its control. And of course, it's from the Mujahideen that Al Qaeda would emerge. Osama bin Laden, of course, being a CIA asset, he was toured around the Middle East in order to recruit for the holy war against the Soviet Union. And then, of course, he forms his group that would then target the uh, United States. So everything that happens abroad inevitably comes back home. And this is true, too of uh, practices of surveillance. So in fact, the practices that we see today are a product of what happened in the Philippines. Practices that were developed uh, to isolate militants when the US occupies the Philippines. Um, and there is, you know, naturally a resistance movement that comes into being. Ways in which to target the leaders of the uh, insurgency movements isolating them, discrediting them, surveilling them, systematically getting information about them. Uh, the book by, what's his name? I'm blanking on the person who writes about this really well. It'll come to me, but probably too late when I'm drinking a glass of wine and all of you are gone. But um, <laughs> I'll try to scream it out loud enough and maybe you'll hear. But anyway, um, yeah, these practices of you know, counterinsurgency, if you will, and counterterrorism around the world get imported back into the United States. And the uh, racialization that takes place of the Philippine population is analogous to the racialization of domestic populations that are also seen as threats to the order. So um, absolutely, and white supremacy, of course, has always been central to uh, this process. But keep in mind that it's not, when we talk about white supremacy, right, it's, 
White supremacy has always been a double-edged sword, which is to say, I'm going to use the words here of W.E.B. Du Bois, who you may have heard of. And he talks about um, how there is a psychological wage that is given to poor white people, working class white people, as a way to get them to identify with the elite in a way that actually acts against their own interests. Right? You think back, for instance, to when the white race was created in the American context. It was one of the key moments in this process, um, as uh, the book The Invention of the White Race lays out in some detail, uh, was in Virginia. Bacon's Rebellion, which was a mishmash of people in the political elite, but also uh, white indentured servants, Native Americans, black slaves and indentured servants, actually rising up against the plantation system. This was a huge threat to the plantation system. And so what did the elite do over a course of a few decades? They would invent the white race, and they would give them some benefits, such as you know, uh, benefits in terms of the legal system. You could, if you were white, you could rape, for instance, a black woman. And that was fine. You would not be brought to justice, because after all, uh, when an entire group of people, black indentured servants, were then turned into chattel slaves, they were seen as no more than property. And so you couldn't be brought to justice if that's what you did. So there was a few privileges that were thrown out in order to divide and conquer. That's how Du Bois puts it, is that there was a psychological wage given in the process of the construction of whiteness and white supremacy, which ultimately really didn't act in the material interests of the vast majority of landless or poor uh, um, white people and so forth. And so we have, I, have, I have a piece that I've written on race, surveillance, and empire where I argue that, in fact, you're seeing security in the current period, particularly after the 1980s and into the war on terror, again, white supremacy comes in as a kind of psychological wage for white people in this country as a way to give their consent to the war on drugs, to uh, mass incarceration, to mass deportation, right? People know that under the Obama administration, we have seen the de deportation of more than two million people uh, from this country, right? And, and what is that based on? It's based on the idea of fear being stoked up against the black male threatening you know, uh, uh, persona, right? They have to be locked up because they might rob us, they might steal from us, or they are you know, gang-related uh, criminals, or they're just you know, all stoked up on drugs and so on and so forth. The war on drugs is largely the product of, uh, uh, is largely responsible for mass incarceration. Or it's immigrants, it's Latino immigrants, they're stealing our jobs and they're a threat to us, right? And so these processes of racialization and the elevation of white supremacy ultimately is also another kind of psychological wage that's being given to the white working classes in an era where we've seen a massive growth of class polarization. In this country, the vast majority of people since the uh, 1970s have actually either seen their wages deteriorate or decline while the 1% has grown enormously wealthy. And actually, it's not the entire 1%. It's the 0.1%. Uh, these are people who live fantastically wealthy lifestyles. Um, I keep going back to New York, but there is a uh, bar that you can go to, the Algonquin Bar, where you can buy a martini on the rock, and it costs $13,000 for one martini. Why? Because there's a diamond in it. Um, I'm asking you to imagine that because can you imagine how many rich people there are that you actually have this drink and that people have so much money to waste that that's how they spend it? You see what I mean? And so we live in an extremely class divided society and this is where capitalism comes in. Um, and the creation of these threats um, and Islamophobia of course is one perfect way in which to scapegoat an entire group of people and to say they're to blame, focus your energy and your attention on them, or the Latino immigrant or what have you, while we laugh all the way to the bank. You know what I mean? And this is not just true of the United States, it's true of Australia, it's true of a whole series of countries, including countries in the global south. India, for instance, with its uh, fascist government in power right now, terrorizes Muslims, and you know they are second-class citizens. I'm, by the way, um, well, I'm an atheist, but my parents are uh, Hindu, and uh, I grew up with Muslim neighbors on either side of my um, house. And so 
I moved to this country in 1992, and when 9-11 happened, it just struck me as so bizarre that an entire group of people who I grew up around, who were just as varied as any other group of people, you know, they are good, they are bad, they are boring, they are interesting, they are, you know, any, like any other group of people, are suddenly being turned into this monolith um, and targeted in these kinds of ways. And so all of this is to say that that too could be a starting point, right? Which is, how is it that these threats are constructed in such a way that our attention is deflected away from a system that is fundamentally based on inequality? And why is all this energy invested on these um, other uh, people who are racialized? Okay, that's a long way to answer just one question, good grief. Uh, Europe is being taken over by Muslims, yes. Um, there has been, um, a ratcheting up by the Islamophobic network of this idea that um, you know Muslims are, are taking over Europe and they're going to introduce Sharia law that's also made its way across the Atlantic. Um, and that image, oh dear, it's gone. This is from a Polish magazine. And you see this blonde, woman being attacked by these brown and black hands, right? The Islamic takeover, the Islamic rape, if you will, of Europe. Uh, the counter-jihad movement, people who study uh, this network of far right wingers uh, in Europe uh, have talked about how this trope has been particularly uh, useful in terms of suggesting that there is uh, uh, this kind of takeover. And of course, it's, it's a fantasy. Um, if you actually look at the reality on the ground, because Muslims, like anybody else, are people who are moving from war-torn regions like Syria, like Iraq, in search of a better life for themselves, just like your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents did. Um, and just like your great-grandparents were, uh, if you happen to have uh, come from Irish stock or Italian stock, or any of these other groups that were racialized in previous um, eras, um, they were demonized in the same ways that uh, Muslims are being demonized uh, today in Europe. So that's all I'll say about that. There's a lot more to be said. Uh, how do I see the threat of uh, terrorism going away? Again, it's. Uh, in the absence of a social movement, in the absence of independent social movements, and I'll try to tie this in with the um, question about how do we create an anti-imperialist left. I mean, I think this is an interesting moment that we're in, which is that Bernie Sanders has actually gotten as much traction as he actually has, right? When he first came on the scene, the Clinton campaign didn't take him seriously. Uh, in fact, a lot of people on the left didn't think that he would make it this far. But the fact of the matter is he's, it's quite exciting that he's actually tapped into um, what has been the legacy of social movements that came before him, whether we're talking about the battle in Seattle, and I know that some of you were part of the anti-WTO protests uh, that took place in 1999, right? I was, I was in DC the year after that to protest the IMF and the World Bank uh, and so forth. But then that ended after 9-11. Um, but then it revived itself in the form of the Occupy Wall Street movement, which coined the phrase, we are the 99%, and is trying to draw attention to class polarization in the neoliberal era. So it's not surprising that Sanders, who's actually giving voice to this extreme class polarization, is actually doing well, particularly among uh, young voters. But it is true that he's really not good on the question of Palestine. He's not good um, when it comes to the war on terror and uh, all the rest of it. And so my own thinking on this question is to build social movements that are independent of the two parties and that actually act to pressure these people to deliver on the kind of demands that we want them to deliver on. And I say that even though I realize it's such a tall order today, because the only movement that we actually have that has any vibrancy is Black Lives Matter. And they have started to shift the conversation around mass incarceration and all the rest of it, but there's 
There's no anti-war movement to speak about, right? There is, however, the BDS campaign, right? The boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign. And uh, uh, many young people are part of it. Uh, even young Jewish students on my campus are no longer buying the kind of uh, propaganda that you know, their parents had bought and they're you know, very much a part of this movement. Actually, it's funny, I was telling the story yesterday to Therese, I think about how I, I teach a class on Islamophobia and on the politics of the Middle East and so on. And routinely I have either, either an agent of the state or a plant from the local Hillel chapter, um, you know, to keep me in line just so I don't actually plant some dangerous ideas in people's heads that I happen to be based on the truth. Uh, but <laughs> it, it never actually, you know, has worked. Um, but I know this because every now and then a student from Hillel will say, oh my God, Professor Kumar, I came in here thinking you're going to be this anti-Semite who's just saying all these awful things, and you're not. And I've really changed my mind and learned quite a lot from you. And so <laughs> I take hope in the fact that if you have, if you spend some time talking to people, patiently, with empathy, not insulting them, you know, uh, and insulting the knowledges that they take for granted, you actually can uh, move them. And of course, every now and then you do get attacked, but you know, that's just par uh, for the course. Therese wanted me to talk about how Fox News took out this campaign um, against me last year. Google it if you're interested, but um, I was actually on Fox and Friends, they're not my friends, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they essentially attacked me for some tweets that I put out, and I stand by those tweets, and I continue to be a critic of empire. But anyway, how do we build an anti-imperialist uh, left? I think there's no easy way to do it. I don't think that you can snap your fingers and actually do it. I think the, it, it, it's a slow process of people actually learning the lessons of history of learning not just about the movements of the 1960s, but learning about what people in this country have done for uh, you know, many decades to actually resist imperialism and, and, and not make the same mistakes, such as half the way with LBJ. People remember that slogan. Somehow we can vote for a Democrat and that uh, you know, he's not going to make the war worse in Vietnam, and that's not true. LBJ actually escalates the war in Vietnam. I think an independent left that uh, intervenes in electoral politics in a certain kind of way to expand the range of debate is the way we can start to actually rearticulate uh, a principled, progressive, anti-racist, uh, anti-sexist, uh, pro-LGBTQ, pro-working class uh, kind of politics, which I think are desperately needed and for which there actually is an opening today, right? In terms of where people are at versus where the mainstream debate is. I mean, what we've seen in this country over the last couple of decades is that the evangelicals and the far right drag the Republicans rightwards, and they've become crazier and crazier and more and more lunatic, right? Donald Trump just being the latest articulation of that. But in the process, the Democrats follow them as well. Me too. The DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council, which is Clinton and Gore and all of those people, was about getting rid of uh, being the party of special interests, by that they mean the working class, the labor movement, African Americans, women, and all the rest of it, and becoming very much an agent of uh, the business class and so on. And so as the climate has shifted to the right in terms of the Republican and the far right, the Democrats have gone along, along with it. And so on every question, the range of debate has become so narrow. And I think people have to be bold and people have to reject those terms and actually be principled in the things that we actually believe in and stand for. And I think that's the only way we can actually break out of the impasse uh, that we're in. And that's why I take inspiration from the Sanders campaign, because it really speaks to the potential that's out there, particularly among young people, to forge an alternative kind of agenda. Together, one last time, please.